All right. Yeah. One minute, like, uh, we'll be ready. We'll be ready to go. So this microphone, you know, I have to add the microphone, which I'm adding now. Sure. And please put the recording on cloud. All right. Uh, yeah, the, the, the recording is on the cloud. <clears throat> Neil, how is my voice? Yeah, it's, it's clear. Uh, yeah, the point is that, uh, Hello. Okay. Now I'm going to turn on that. Okay, Neil, can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, please increase the volume a little bit more. Okay. How is it now? Is it better? Is it uh, better? Yeah, a little more would be much better actually. Or probably take it a little nearer. Hello? Yes. How is it now? Yeah, it's better. It's better. <clears throat> so shall we begin? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope the recording is on on the cloud. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, should we wait a minute or two or continue? Yeah, Kishori, you need to increase the volume a bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope it's uh, I hope it's working. Now let's see. How is it now? Is it better? Yes, yes, it's better. Okay. Um, so, should we wait for a minute or two or start? Uh, no, we should start actually. It's already 6.12, so we need to start. Okay. Okay. So, uh, just as an aside, yesterday I saw in the BBC news that, you know, some countries are using facial recognition, even in their supermarket and stuff like that. Going, going and to identify, you know, identify people and so on. Uh, let me make sure. Okay, there is something interesting. Great, okay. Neil, can you hear me? One more time. Yes, it's clear, it's clear now. So yeah, I read yesterday somewhere that, um, in BBC actually, that uh, China or other countries are using facial recognition so uh, to recognize, identify people. So maybe if we have time, we'll try to see if we can cover facial recognition, face recognition algorithms using machine learning techniques. That's what they use. So, but anyhow, so let us continue where we left off last time and we'll start slowly. Hopefully more people will join and then we'll so um, in most of the machine learning libraries or calculations you want to do, so usually you require a few libraries for numerical computation because pure programming, doing everything from scratch is time consuming, ineffective. So, uh, so one of them is called NumPy. Okay, this is a library. Uh, the NumPy library, the goal is it is essentially matrix sort of data. You know, a matrix of numbers, say two, three, four, and so on. Say it's some, you know, 100 by 100 maybe. Even images are represented like this. And this is suitable for computing with arrays. So you don't have to create a node from scratch. So that is just pure data structure for any type. Then you need another library called SciPy. 
This is suitable for algorithms, numerical algorithms. I'm sure that you have seen in your college where you have to solve equations like ax equal to b. These are essentially um, linear equations in matrix form and you need to solve for x. And x could be even, <clears throat> I don't know, 100 dimensional, 1000 dimensional, a large number. Sci-fi is the Python library. It's for scientific Python. Some people used to use MATLAB, but you have to pay for it, and it's not, but this is directly in Python. So you can easily install and use it in your work. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, sci-fi, numpy. So then what else do we need? Well, this is for storing data in the matrix format. And we will later look, when we do image processing and stuff in using machine learning, we'll look at this. Sci-fi gives you algorithms. You don't have to reinvent all these algorithms. Remember you have to do in your probably engineering or 10th grade, you have a matrix and you need to invert. Two, three, four, five, three, two, one, six, nine. You need to invert. You need to, this is suppose a matrix. You need to find inverse such that becomes identity matrix. Sci-fi is your library. So then you need matplotlib. Matplot. This is for plotting. You need to plot like we have been using it in our life work. So matplotlib is for nice plots, graphs. And a lot of data science is a lot about making beautiful plots that are meaningful. And we'll look at it, the visualization aspects of it. When we, we will probably try to have something on visualization. Then what else? Well, pandas, which is where we go back to again. We were doing last time a little bit, pandas. This is, this, this is more like a tabular, like an Excel. Think of it like Excel. And today we'll spend a lot of time on pandas. And these are, maybe one is a number, number, and these are names, and some other things. So they could be numbers, names, strings, values, and these are all mixed up, column by. Think of it like Excel file, and manipulations. I want all the names, all the rows that have certain values, and so on. So this is also a Python library. Actually, you will see that in many data science positions, they will ask you for this NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas. Any questions so far? So these are very important things and we'll be covering them. Today we will focus on Pandas and also on Python programming. Okay, so let us see. Now let's go back to where we left off last time. <clears throat> okay, so you should see my screen now. Yes, uh, you'll see my screen. So last time, what were we doing? <clears throat> and we'll go from there. So this is for Louis. Uh, okay, so here is what we were doing, yes, last time. Let's go back. So this is the Jupyter notebook we were dealing with last time. And here you go, pandas, numpy, matplotlib. Seaboard is another tool that makes the plot prettier, more beautiful. And stats model which we need later. And matplot inline. This is a command to tell Jupyter that I want all the plots to come inside the Jupyter. So then last time we loaded data from the internet. Oh, so now PD is not defined. That's because I did not execute this line, this first chunk. I did, now I did. So I get this data, TV, radio, newspaper, sales data. Then we describe the data. Then you have questions about mean, median. Uh, this is median, as you know, 50%. Mean, median, 
the number of counts, we got an idea. Then I showed you how to create Pandas data set, uh, a little bit Pandas data set. How to take A, B, three arrays, and how to use zip, how to stitch together three arrays simultaneously so that it creates three rows, and then I created a Pandas data frame. And we will come to this today, that what is a Pandas data frame? So Pandas data frame is essentially the basic unit of data storing. So look at this. A data frame, it has a column name, it has rows and values. So think of Pandas, and this is the unit of, like it's like an Excel sheet. Excel workbook has many worksheets, and worksheet is one thing you see on the screen. So think of it like that. Then I showed you that, well, pandas make life a lot easier. If you use dot, say here we have three columns, A, B, C, and you put dot A, so it actually spits out the full array. Let us try to do that again. I'm going back here. Uh, this, I'm just describing. I'm adding here. Here I am going to zip them and create a panda data set and I showed you this as well. DAP dot A you see here DAP dot A it showed up here. DAP dot B now it should be it always showed the last one you need. Okay. So this is what I wanted to show you. So this is where we were. Then I showed you that it also makes your life easy. So you want to do element-wise adding. So it says you want to add these two numbers and create a new column. Add these two, so on. And here we were able to do that. And you saw our proof. For example, this is 8.0. Here you saw 5 plus 3. It has become 8. So then after this also I could seem to similarly do describe. So, another thing I want to say, remember, is that, uh, yes, this data that I loaded here, this variable got overwritten here, you see? Oh no, I did not yet. That's good. DAT. I kept a different variable name. DAT. Data means this is the sales data. Here we were actually also able to multiply by, you know, square, uh, square the data. Uh, this is not square, this is multiplying by two, it's doubling it. So then I was plotting some figures. These, you know, three figures, and so on. So this is something we were doing. And then here I was creating three subplots, and this is the figure size. Then first I said, these are the values. And I want to call it name. So for each plot, you have to give a title. Because I wanted in one row three figures, that's what gives you this, this is one row and three figures. So one, this is one one, this is one two, this is one three. Or if you start counting, in Python as you know we start from zero, one, two. So now let's look at this, how I plot. I have the data already loaded. And I'm interested in the sales data, data.sales. How did I know about it? Here, data.sales is this. Here I'm only showing you the top 10 data. Oh, something. <coughs> data.sales. And I'm saying this is box plot for sales. So the zero means the first one, and this is the title. And then box plot is a statistical function that is built into this system, this kind of plots. Where is this plot? PLP. It's a short name for what? This is a short name for some sub-library of matplot. And I call it PLP. So matplotlib has several libraries and I'm interested in PyPlot, and I call it PLP. That's what it means. This dot means there is a sub-library. Sub 
And today we will spend time about how to write classes at all in Python. Why am I doing this? Well, this is the bread and butter of data science to get started. Before you do facial recognition, you have to learn how to plot an image, load an image, manipulate an image, apply machine learning algorithm, and print the results. So here, what else did I do? Box plot. I'm plotting as an array. Well, what is array? It's an array of values. So what am I doing here? Well, I am converting into a NumPy. So NumPy. Yeah, feel free to ask any question anytime. Interrupt me. It's very important that you understand um, anything that confuses. NumPy is the library. I, NumPy is good at creating arrays. As I said earlier, NumPy likes to deal with arrays and matrices. So I put the values, it created a NumPy object. NP is a NumPy import. Let me show you here, which I did long before and I call it NumPy. So these are your data science bread and butter tools. These are workman's tools. So I loaded that array. Now why do I have to do it in NumPy array? Well, this is usually the case. When you want to load data from outside, you load it in Panda, manipulate, but when you want to do calculations such as plot, computing an inverse, then you should make a NumPy kind of object. This is suitable for numerical calculation. Okay. <clears throat> so then I was going to do the next plot, histogram. Histogram is, I will explain what it is and why I'm doing it. After I explain, and I will show you the plot. So then I'm going to do all these plots. Then we'll go back to Python and also focus on classes and stuff and our so let me explain the idea of histogram. Even though you have seen it, I'm still going to explain carefully why, where the tricks are. And that's where it will force you to start thinking about the difficulties. Okay. So let's think about, so this is the NumPy array I was talking about. This is a matrix, but two dimensional array is essentially a matrix as you know. Histogram, let's talk about. Say you have some numbers, say grades right, of students, 100 students, some marks, 100 students. All the marks, one, two, three, 100. Somebody got 56, these are marks. These are serial number. 56, 78, uh, 78, 96, so on. Or it could be 1,000, doesn't matter. So the goal of histogram is to get a sense of how people, the data is distributed. Well, one common sense thing to do is that divide them into blocks of 10, 20, uh, 30, 40, and so on. And say this is 70, 80, 90, and 100. So you look at the marks, find out how many are in the range from 0 to 10. And that's it. And this is, and then this is a called count or frequency, FRE frequency. And then you make a plot. Say, I got say, this is say 100, 0 to 10. Well, I don't want to make them have no marks too much. Say, this is 50, this is 25, this is 75. I'm going to use red color and say 0 to 10, how many of them got? Like, say, maybe around 25 students got, or 26. So I draw a box like this. So similarly, 10 to 20, say, you know, another 20, uh, something, 30 of them got, and so on. You'll fill these boxes, 
bars, columns. Histogram plot. Okay. A lot of people would call it bar plot. See, here, 80 to 90, how many people got? Well, about 25 of them. Well, you have to be careful. You should not be like all add up to more than 100. That would be ridiculous. So I think I should make it, I should better be careful and make 1,000 students. You see the problem now. Now, the question is, how finely should you divide the histogram? Histogram plot. Well, that depends how big these buckets are. Maybe if you made it bigger buckets, twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, and hundred, how would it look? Would it look the same? Well, maybe this is the frequency again. Uh, Say so this is hundred. It's a slightly. And maybe it would look like this. Something funny, I don't know. Uh, but approximately, you see that based on the bin size, sometimes histograms will look different. So the idea is that you should select these bin size so that there are enough number of points. Because if you make it extremely small of size one, say I make bins of all size one, say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to 100. Then most of them will be empty. It will look like some jagged. It's hard to see a trend. So you have to control this bin size. One thing we know that of all the values, you have a maximum value, minimum value. This is the range. Then you select that size. And that's something I'm going to show you now. And that is some softwares are good at doing it automatically. And sometimes, if you have too few data, it will look not very good. So you have to play with it. And that's what I'm going to do now. <clears throat> All right. So let's do histogram. So here is what. I'm interested in making the axis one, that is the second one I'm making it. We haven't done this part uh, yet. <clears throat> so let's run it. Okay, I got this. These two are empty because I did not plot it. However, I did keep the name histogram for sales. Now I want to calculate the minimum value of sales and maximum. Let's see, print it out. Min and max. And I put underscore because minimum and maximums are already functions that are built in. You see here, this is a Python built in function. If you give it an array, it will calculate the minimum. If you give it, a, this is the maximum function. These are a part of Python. So that's, why, that's why I call these variables underscore. I mean, you could still call them min max. It's okay. Uh, but you have to be careful. These functions will be disabled then. I'll explain to you that in a second. Ah, so here is your minimum and maximum for sales. So let me, um, actually I'm afraid to even do min max because this, if you do this variable name, the older value will be, the meaning of the definition of the function will be gone. It will not be available to me. I have to restart it, probably. That's why I'm not doing it. It's a building function. Uh, okay, so this is the maximum and minimum. Now, what else do I need to do? I need to make the boxes size. So all I know is that I have the maximum and left and right margin from between 3.2 to 5.4. So I need to make, and I have 200 data points, as you saw, saw from before. Size of the data is 200 points. You can look at it here, 200. So you have to now think about it. How many do you want it to show up? So here is what the bin size. I call it delta. <clears throat> Max minus min divided by the length of values, 200, or divided by five. I made it even smaller. So, so that means, oh, this is by the way, not divided, it is multiplying up actually. This is, when you put a star here, it's this, as you know. 
like this actually. Okay. So, but never mind, we do not need that. Um, worry. So, so this value would be delta. Let's see how much I do. Okay, so delta is 1.7. So that means you can think of it. I have about 1.7 and I have maximum and minimum between 3 to 54. So 50 slots and 200 points. So you can do the math. So how many slots will be there? No. So that slot, for example, that you can get by dividing by delta. How many are there? So is that enough? Maybe it is enough. Let's look at it. Take the value and you call the plot called hist here. In the axis, you this is what that plot lib returns to you. These figures, the concept of the, the handle for these figures. And there you call hist on this data histogram. And these are the bins. NP earrings is something I'll tell you. First, let's print out what is NP rings. Is. This is important for you to know. This is an important function. NP, A, R, A, N, U, rings, U, max, delta. What is it? All right. This is what it means. As you know, we found delta to be some 1.27. So here you go. This is the first value. You start from minimum, then we'll go all the way up to maximum. Here it is. We know maximum value is 5.4, well, 54. What it will, it will do is that first it will take 3.2, add that 1.27, that delta. Let me print out what delta is again. This is important. You will use this function always again. So 3.2, you start with always the minimum value. Add 1.27 to that, you get next value. To that next value, keep adding, and you get the subsequent value. So at every step, you are adding 1.27. And now what happened to this now? Look at this. 52.73, after you add 1.27, it becomes more than 54.0 actually. It goes beyond it. It's probably 50.04 or something. It goes 73 plus 27. So it is right on it. But because it is a series of numbers which increments by delta but always less than max. So you have to exclude it. And that's where it stops here. So these are the bin size, you see? The ones I was drawing in the figure, 10, 20, 30, 40, so on, in gaps of 10. Or in the second one, we tried 20, 40, 60. And in the third one is the very extreme case, each bin is one. So this is our bin. And I'm going to plot now with these bins. Here is what I get. So, now, Jupiter has this strange behavior that anytime you make a command, it spits out some output that are annoying, that are internal. You can hide it by putting an underscore equal. Underscore means it's a variable that I don't care. Equal to, it's going to nowhere, nowhere kind of thing. You see, now that those ugly things do not show up. But if I remove this, it shows up again. So that is the trick. So the last statement that you have, you can do that. Or I can do this, right? Assign something, three to some three value, and it suppresses that, those internal value. This it prints because I wish to print it. That's a part of my command. Same thing. So now you see what happens. So now what happens if I increase each of these bucket size by five. How do I do that? Well, this was my delta size. So I can double it maybe, make it 10. This is double. 
So here is what I will read. Maximum minus minimum, dividing it by the number of values, 200, and multiplying that difference by 10. Now, let's see what we get. So this would be again your 2.54. Oh, I am a little, I should have done this multiplication here. So I'm printing values, not, it's not important to print here. I want to print it here. I got the results, but I did not print them already. So here, we calculate delta again. Now, we do the same thing we get plot-wise. Here you, you see. 2.54. Look at that. Now you have histogram. Maybe some of you like it. Maybe some others will say it's still ugly. It does not represent the data. To me, this is a reasonably good histogram. I mean, it tells you that the sales data is around, most of them are around between 20 to 30. Few are up to 50, very few are below 10. What about if we do 20, double it? It's also not bad. It gives you an idea. So what about even double? It is not very useful. It is useful those who think, but it's not very good representative of the numbers because we these are our bins, bin size, 3.2 to 13.6. 13.6 to 23.5. That's how we divide it. So let's go back to 10. I thought that was nice. <clears throat> it's nice. I mean, even 20 is not bad. So this is, so far, um, that is, it is giving us an idea about the spread. The box plot gave us, these were the maximum, that is, uh, this is the maximum, that is the minimum, this is the 50%, this is 25%, and that is 75%. That means, 75% means 75% of the points are here. Here means 50%. Half of the values are on the left side, another half is on the right side. This means 25% means 25% of the values are less than this line, wherever that is, maybe that is 20 point something, uh, depending on the value. Let's go and look up. Uh, you need to get used to seeing, see? Uh, oh, sales. It would be, now 10.375, yeah, we will expect it here. Why did it happen? That's because we multiplied everything by two last time. So that's why everything increased. Because if you do data describe now, you will see things increase the numbers. Uh, let me do that for you. Uh, let me not rerun it again because it will become four times. It's already doubled. So now data. So look at it here, 20.75, 20 20.75 here. So now we know what is a box plot, what is a histogram, we know that. Any questions so far? Because these are important statistical methods people use in descriptive statistics. And you should be able to plot your data quickly. If you are going to be a data scientist, you should have these tools handy because this is a very easy and quick way to communicate your ideas to anywhere. Like even if you're writing an article, say, as a data scientist to the you know, Times of India, these are the things people understand. Maybe not so much the box plot, but definitely the histogram. Neil, any question? Hi, Gishore. Sorry, please say. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, just uh, one question regarding this 25%, 50%, 75%. Mm -hmm. Why is it, is it standard or it can be considered like 30%, 60%, 90% as well? Why is always considered as 25%? You can uh, pick 30%, 90% uh, as well. Um, however, yes, 25, 50, and 75 is standard. Okay, sure, your voice is getting down. Hello. Okay, how is it, is it getting? Is it okay now? Uh, yeah, you need to little, little more actually, probably. Okay, maybe uh, 
Yeah, let's see, let's see. Okay, yeah. Is it getting? Rajesh, can you hear me? Or Rupesh, can you hear me? Yeah, now it's better. Okay. So, okay. So, yes. So, these are standard because 25, 50, and 75 are commonly used. You can okay. use it. Yeah. Uh, but for box plot, I am sure that there are options to manipulate them. But by default, these are the number of stops. And, uh, yeah. So, any other question? That's, that's a great question. And another question, like, uh, what is standard error of mean? So it's a little yeah. different. Standard but... error means essentially standard deviation. Standard deviation is essentially, um, I will show you how to calculate that actually with code. And even though, you know, it might look simple, it's important that you know, because we are also learning Python here. So let me take the data and calculate standard error. And let me uh, stop sharing the screen. And there is an interesting fact about standard error. And I, will, I want to tell you about it. Suppose somebody gives you a data, set of data sets. And let's call it A1. A1 could be 5. A2 could be three, A4, A2, A3, something, A4, A5, three, five, seven, eight. Somebody tells you that calculate the standard deviation or standard error. Both are used synonymously. First, what you do is that you calculate the mean, average. So that is five plus three plus five plus seven plus eight plus divided by five. So that is 15 plus 25, 28 divided by 3, whatever number that is. Oh, 5. Yeah. So that is 5.6. Yeah. Yes, 5.6. Now you need to calculate standard deviation. What you do is standard error or standard deviation. Uh, you simply take each number individually, 5 minus the mean, and square it. The next number, 3 minus, again mean, keep subtracting the average or mean. This is mean or average, A, B, E, R, average, or mean, you call it. People like to use the symbol M. All the numbers. 8 minus 5.6 and divided by 5. Look at it. You have made the number bigger by squaring it up. But yes, if it was negative, positive, did not matter. They are all positive numbers. That's the benefit of squaring. But now they have become bigger. If I was measuring something in terms of centimeters, now everything is centimeter squared. It has become look like that. So do a square root after adding this, then it becomes centimeter, right? So this is the deviation. And I am going to show you now something that this standard deviation gives you an idea about how spread around the numbers are. So let's go to, back to the histogram and you will see an idea about what I mean by that. <coughs> Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, Kishore, my yeah. question is re related to histogram. Uh -huh. I didn't get the value. Uh, I mean, x part of the histogram. Like, so what it's holding against? Ah, I see. That is a good question. And anyway, so that these are the values. Uh, if you can see, <clears throat> these are the values of range, bucket size, right? So here, mm -hmm. let's look at um, the for, uh, something like 30 something, right? Uh, let's look at here 30 something. 20, between 28 and 31.14, here around, mm -hmm. you have, you go up to the height, about 12 values. That's all it says. You see? Let's look at this guy, at this. 
This is about probably 24, 24 something, between 24 or 23.52 and 26.06, how many data points are there? Or how many values of sales are within that? So this is telling you, well, about 25, uh, 26, 25, about 26 values are within that range. That's what it is giving you. Uh, did it clarify? No, no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get it. Okay. So here, I'm here. Um, let me use the board. That mm -hmm. is, okay. That's important. To go. So standard deviation, we'll come back to that if we need to. But here is how you make a histogram. Suppose I give you a number, 5, 7, 6, 8, 11, 2, 4, 1, 3, 3 again, 4 again, 7 again, 8, 2, 3. Okay. So I see the value. Everything is between 11 and 1. Okay. I know 11 and 1. Uh, now I want to see it. Well, how many numbers are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 numbers. How many buckets do I need to make? Well, between 1 and 11, well, let's make it 3 buckets. I don't know, equal, all equal. So 1 and 11, that's a range of 10. So maybe I can make it 4, 5, 5 buckets if you need. 3, 1 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 9, 11. Okay? So you so far clear, right? So I took the range, max, minimum is smallest value is 1, largest value is 11. And I see, I'm going to see, do a counting. How many numbers are between, how many, of, how many values I got that are between 5 and 7? Seven, 7 and 9. So I'm going to do 1 and 3. Which one is between 1 and 3? 1, 2. Three, I will not, right side you will not count. It's always from one, anything but three. Okay. Mm -hmm. The right side. So I have one candidate, I have two, I have another. That's it, between one and three. So let's mark this range. This is a scale, how many I got. So this is one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, so on. So between one and three, I got three guys. Okay. Between three and five, including three though. Now three, but anything less than five, but not exactly five. How many do I sell? Five, I'm not going to include. Two is not, two is smaller than three, so I don't care. Four, yes, four. Four, three also I got, three also I got. Another three I got. One, two, three, four, five. Let's complete that completely, okay? It's just good. Five to seven. Five, including five, and not seven though. Anything less than seven. Five is a candidate. Six is one. That's it, I guess two. So, at two. Seven and nine, anything here we get? Let me use the black marker. Seven and nine. Here is one, seven. Eight is one, another. Anything? Eleven is not a candidate, these are considered. Oh, this is another seven, four. Four. You'll see, I'll come to distribution again, right? four, right? Let's see. So now 9 and 11, how many are there? All I see is this. 11, the right side, because that's the maximum, it is inclusive. You can include because it's right side, extreme. There's nothing more than that. So that is 1. Let's look at it. One. So let me color it. So now, right? so now this. Now that we are revisiting it, we should make use of it. <clears throat> How many points are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Total number of points is 15. Let's count them. How many are here? 3 plus 5, 8. The next one is 8 plus 2, 10. 10 plus 4, 14. Plus 1, 15. Uh, they all add up to 15. Mm -hmm. There are 15 points. All I have done is distributed it. This looks like very much, if I had more numbers here, I could have increased the count a little bit more. This what, what, is, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So what will we say that uh, the points which are we are plotted on y axis? So what when I mean uh, what to name it? I mean, yeah. You call it you call it frequency. Okay. You call it frequency. So okay. Go ahead. Okay. So in that particular block, so that much scale has increased, like three, like four, and like five. Mm, yes. Correct. Yes. This is not about increment. It gives you. If somebody asks you, hey, uh, these are the grades people got between 1 to 0 to 10, say. So it's a grading system in exam. And the teacher looks at it. He will be like, hey, most of the guys got between 3 and 5. My class is getting 3 and 5. I think there is a good student here. He got 1. Maybe there is one good student who really got 9 to 11. Let's say, actually up to 11, say. And he will say like that. And then he will say, well, hey, you know what? Between 5 and 7. It's weird. That's a very average means. You guys are average. It looks like my class is either full of bad students or a couple of good students. The average is like pretty poor. You mm -hmm. see how I'm thinking? Okay. So now you have a class of 15. What if you have a class of 20? And this I want to relate, take this opportunity to relate it to probability distribution. This is very interesting. <clears throat> and, you, and that is that is important for you to realize, realize the distribution, which will come later, but I want to kind of find you. Say, somebody says, this is how all classes, some another school inspector comes and says, hey, this is how other classes do. I noticed in another place I went, the same kind of distribution I noticed, behavior. Few of them are, poor students, suddenly somewhere towards the poor end, there are quite a lot of students. And there are very few, one or two good students. That's all I see. So now, suppose somebody gives you another data set, uh, histogram, right? Let's create 15 numbers and go through this exercise, and I want to relate to <clears throat> This is data set one. Let's look at data set two. Exactly 15 numbers I'll take. 7, 3, 2, 4, 1, 6, 9, 8, 3, 2, 5, 2, 2, 2, 1. Okay. I'm going to make it swap right away quickly. This is also between 0 to 11. 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, 3, 5, Seven, nine, eleven. So how many are between one and three? How do you write that? The, yeah, this is important, guys. I keep on telling that hey, inclusive one, but anything but not three exactly. This is the symbol for this interval. This is called interval in analysis and calculus. Left close, right open interval. This means anything greater than or equal to one, anything greater than or equal to one, right? But definitely less than three. It could be 2.99999, but not three. <clears throat> so this is called left close right open interval. So histogram counting should be done that way. So I deliberately want to Say somebody also had a decimal point, 2.5, 3.6, I don't know. That's to make you happy. So one and three, how many I got? I got one, one and three. Three I cannot count. Two is between that interval. This is interval, that is interval, okay. 
So let me sample them so that I can actually identify. Uh, this is a candidate, 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 this is a candidate. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's narrow them. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you got here yourself a six students. Okay. So now I'm asking, what about between three to five? Oh, I forgot this. This also should be there. In fact, seven. See, 2.5 is also in that interval. So we're here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is there anything I'm leaving out? Three, we cannot. Yes. It's going up to seven. This is it. Okay, three to five. Who are there? Five, I cannot include. Three, definitely. Three to five, 3.6 is within that region. Four is true, three is there too. One, two, three. Yeah, five I cannot include, not, not, not nothing else. So I got three here. So I'm going to use here red color. Here, seven, three. Okay, so now I want to capture the rest. What about five to seven? Yep, he's a good candidate. I call it this. Five and six is good. Mm. No one, seven is not a part of it, so two. I call it two. This is wrong. So then I have only a few numbers left. Seven and nine. Yes, he's a good, he's a candidate. He's a candidate. Nine, no, because it's dark. It has to be less than or equal to that. So two I got here. Two. And for nine, I have only one. Let's count it again. <clears throat> How many I got? Seven plus three is 10. 10 plus two is 12. Another two is 14, 15. But look at the pattern. Which? On an average, it looks like the students in this class is poor. It's giving you a distribution. Use the word like we commonly would like to think distribution. Like this is a pattern. So one thing is for sure, it's not about how many students you have. Even if you have 100 students, probably from this class, maybe it will follow the same pattern. The more you take numbers, probably at one point you'll see a much more stable picture. It does not change much. So that's why histogram is useful, you see. This tells you that as the grades increase, generally the number of students are fewer. Most of the class is not very good. It's a distribution of sign of poor students in this class. In this class, there are a few poor students, but most of them are okay. So this is the intuition. And this is going to be the probability distribution also. This is from a sample, and when you talk about a random variable, which we'll discuss later, or images. Now, let me give you an intuition about how do you recognize characters, A and B, using machine learning. Okay. And that, with that, after that, I will give a short break, but I want to say, this is a histogram, and you, so a lot of you have probably seen this. What is so big deal about it? I've seen this for a long time. Now I'll tell you where it's going to make a difference. But before I wipe this board, do you have any question on that, Rupesh? Okay. No question. <laughs> Sunil, can you hear me? Yes, it's clear. Yes. Yeah, I'm following you. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you an example about. Do not think this is the class on that, which will cover like, about character recognition, but this is something I will give you an idea. The idea is optical character recognition. It's another machine learning application. So what happens is that a lot of times you have old documents. Say you want to digitize. So in the state of Karnataka, the government decides that all these typewritten papers from old offices, they want to computerize it. They want to scan all the bar certificates, everything. And now they want to 
extract and make it electronic PDF. Think about the old typewriter. I don't know, I can't even write those letters now. Some funny thing, car. So what they do, car license or car loan, say. So you scan this document. And, and the topic, the idea people call it is scanning is called optical character recognition. Some of you must have seen this idea, recognition. And this is a very good machine learning application, OCR. So what they will do, they will scan it, the document. From there, they will create little picture out of every block. Every word, they will cut it into pictures here, every letter. Now, let's look at one picture. This is English. And we will do it later with amazing. <coughs> so now, you ask yourself, and now another picture is R. Another, another, let's take look at that second one, AC. And I'll show you an application of histogram here in machine learning. A. Great. So it scans it from the scan document, it creates pictures out of everyone, just like you have your Facebook picture, your picture. What does a picture consist of? It is an array of numbers, each picture. Usually, let's say, in optical character recognition, it may be 50 by 50 or 20 by 20 pixels. So there are 20 by 20 pixels. One, say this is five, this is five, this is five. So 20 by 20, so this is essentially pixels. There will be about 20 by 20 slots. There are 20 of them and 20 of them. And what does it say? How do you know? This is white. So usually the white values are 255 values, okay? The values in each of this matrix, 20 by 20 matrix, is a range of integers between 0 to 255. 255 is considered white, completely white. So here, in this case, you will find a lot of, say, dark. Zero is dark. Maybe zero, 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 zero. zero. This is the A, right? Zero, 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 zero. Okay. And some will have intermediate values. Maybe five. Maybe, maybe there is a little dot here dirty because all scanned documents are not perfectly clean. Right? There is a lot of that dirty spots, things all around. It's not perfect zero or not perfect 255. What they do here is that they create for this guy and this guy separately. They create a histogram. And we know how many points are there, right? How many values are there? 20 by 20 is 400 values. 400 values. So think about a histogram. 400 values, what is the range? 0 to 255. Or you could increase it to even 60, depending on the resolution, how smart you think your algorithm can take advantage of. So, of course, we have to create a histogram up to 255. Maybe we go, I don't know, 25, 25, or 20, 20, I don't know, <clears throat> 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. 140, 160, 180, 220, 240, and 260. I'm going to draw in a much smaller scale here because I'm going to run out of space. I'm going to make it even, in fact, 40 to make it easier. Let's see. Uh, 255, how do I get there? Okay, let's make it 40, 80, 120, 160, 200, 
260. Of course, we never get values here. For C, you see how many value places, what is the histogram pattern? So if you got this, you got this kind of a pattern. How many? For A, also you will get a histogram pattern. Let me draw it in blue. Although I don't think this blue color is all that great. But let me shorten this document. This is a document you scan from the Motor Vehicle Inspector's Office. So, okay. So this is, also you will do a same histogram. 40, 80, 120, 60, 200, 240, and 60. So maybe here, the pattern you got is like this. And here you got this. You see there is a signature. Maybe if you had another C somewhere, another C here, you'll also see a very similar, maybe there will be more dots and things here. No, it's not exactly same as that. Maybe that is also dirty, maybe the paper got twisted. You have another C here, exactly similar kind of looking, but these dots are in different places. Somehow here more dirty on the corner. But approximately when you look at the histogram of this guy, you will find some way a structure very similar in that. A pattern similar in the middle it's high, okay? So this and this will be similar. So you can say this is C, this is A. So everybody has a signature. How do you do that? You do by looking at eyes one by one, all look similar. You would use a neural network and you feed these numbers, histogram numbers. One, two, look at this. How many numbers will be there to represent one character's histogram? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, six seven. Another one. Maybe sixty. Forty, eighty, one twenty. Oh, the sixty, one eighty, two hundred twenty, two hundred forty. Yeah. Same number, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven numbers are required for every character. One, two. These are seven. Another character. Character means this. Two. Another seven. They are different values. Maybe they, let me call it prime. What are these values? Well, all you know is that there are some number between zero to um, ah. yes. So all there are some numbers between zero to four hundred because the maximum you have is four hundred here. You cannot have more than four hundred points. So zero to four hundred somewhere. But there is this idea. So now, this is called features. So what have you done here? <clears throat> you were a data scientist, you were an engineer, you got your BTEC from electrical engineering and uh, electronics, and you look at this problem, you're like, hey, I know what an image is. This is an image. Hey, I use some algorithm to block them, which is straightforward. Take the pictures and count the pixels, create the histogram, extract these numbers, this is called feature extraction. This problem is called. You have created these features. Feature extraction. This is what traditional machine learning, or even today, we use. Extract something you think is useful information that is embedded in the thing. And this is the ingenuity or cleverness of the engineer who thought, "Hey, I'm going to look at the." Character and I'm going to do a histogram of the blow it up as a big character, C or A, and I'm going to make a histogram. Histogram is great if you look at two eyes. I'm going to create seven numbers out of it, and I'm going to create a neural network and learn the pattern. First, I look at a few of them, label them because I'm a human being, I can see uh, what letters are there. But once my algorithm learns, our different feature vector. This is called feature vector. The whole thing is a vector, right? You have done in engineering x, y, z vector, except here it's a seven dimensional vector and it takes values between zero to 400. So this is called feature vector. Feature vector. 
So each one is a PCR vector, individual one is called a PCR. And the whole process of getting from image to this is called PCR extraction. We have got the numbers. So an example PCR would be like this maybe 30, 200, 40, 30, 27, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 25, I don't know, to make it 400, whatever is required here uh, at that number. So that would be an example of PCR vector. So the idea is that all the C's will have a Fisher vector, they are more or less similar. That's a big problem. What do you mean by similar? So why don't we do one thing? Take a, uh, no, we continue actually, we continue. Any questions? Now I'm going to discuss what on earth is two vectors are similar mean. So do you have any questions? Neil? Yeah, the one question is that uh, does the features actually decide the how, how, how the uh, vector would be written? It is you who design the vector. It is who. Sorry? You, can you hear me? Yes. It is the. Uh, can you repeat your question? Does the feature remove? No, I mean to say that it does, does the factors, uh, does the features decide the vectors? I see. Uh, the vectors are defined based on the feature. So maybe x1, uh, maybe you always put the first value here in the first. The next guy here, you can also switch them as long as you keep it consistent. There is nothing great about that 240 to 260, I have to keep it in the seventh column, seventh value. You can have them, but make sure that order is fixed. Between 120 to 60, I always put it in the third place. Look consistent. Did you answer? If not, yeah. yeah. So that is something you make a judgment. And it would mean the same. It would not have any difference. And if it does make a difference, then you did not formulate the right way. Soon, I'm going to tell you about the idea of what does it mean to be close to each other ladder. What does it mean for two vectors to be almost close? And that will also connect us back to standard deviation and root mean square. Okay. Hi, Kishori. Yeah. Uh, Kishori? Yes, go ahead. So how, so how do you differentiate the two different uh, this characters of C? Because the two, C, two Cs are different plotting, right? Yes. So how do we finally, how do we recognize so these two are same value, same name or something like that? Yes. So I will get to this. So I, uh, so what I'm going to do is that we move this middle part and explain that part. Your question. And Kishori, Kamal here. Yes, Kamal. On, on, on similar lines, so if it is an O and if it is a zero. Right. Then how do you differentiate that, right? That is a good question. Very good question. Uh, let's deal with it too, right? So first, deal with Jokinder's question and immediately tackle the other question. So my document is here. So, and then finally answer Neil's question also, several of them. First of all, what do I mean by two vectors being equal, right? So in two-dimensional vectors, we used to have this x and y, right? X so suppose vector v1, and we this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. V is equal to x1, y1. That's the coordinate. V2 is another vector. I'm using the symbol. I'm using these three, three lines. means almost equivalent. It's the same thing. Right. As opposed to equal. That means this symbol means essentially this. So it has two coordinates. Okay. If these two coordinates are similar, so... Think about a cosine of the angle. Take a you know, perpendicular from here. You notice that the cosine is close to zero. If they're exactly on top of each other, like here, the two lines, the cosine of zero is one. And they could be different if the another vector is there, 
cosine could be slightly bigger than zero, but also it will be less than one. And if those factors are like this, they have nothing in common. That will be zero, cosine of 90. If it is opposite, if it is going this way, that is going this way, that becomes closer and closer to somewhere minus, say, point E. And if they are exactly opposite, minus one. So, things can be between minus one to one and zero. Zero means there is nothing common. One means they are exactly alike almost. Negative one means it's opposite, not independent. This is at least independent. So now let's go back to that. So the way you calculate the similarity between two vectors is this formula. Suppose somebody gives you a vector, v1, and we will write x1, uh, x1, x2, okay? Instead of y, I will write x2. It's a good symbol, I'll tell you. What about the second number one vector I'm talking about? Let's don't even use substitute. V prime. This is the first Fisher vector value. Second, the way you decide how they are similar, the dot product is the cosine is this formula. V dot, you must have seen this in elementary algebra, dot product. And the way it is done is that x1 times x1 prime plus or x2. This is the dot product. But you essentially multiply product wise. But there is a problem here. What about the value vectors are maybe one is large, one is big. They are both in the same direction. Two, guys, two are short, two are long. But in both cases, there is similarity, is the sense of similarity, it's the same. I need to normalize it, scale it down. Scale it down for the first vector, v1, v2, make it normalized. You simply take the Euclidean size or distance from zero. This is called the size of a vector or normal. Okay. First guy, second guy. Uh, prime, prime squared. This is called a dot product of a factor. If it is one, it is, they are similar exactly. In the sense, they may be in the same direction, right? Maybe this A has, maybe this C has more thick. Shape is similar, but it is just a little bit thicker. Maybe, I don't know, something we'll see. Uh, but this is called a dot product or the cosine between the two vectors. This is what is used, you know, dot product base, or uh, cosine angle base similarity. If it is one, they're similar. If it is minus one, they're opposite. If it, one happens this way, the other happens that way. That's all. So I would expect, now I taught you about only two dimensional vector. What about three dimensional? Well, then you can say there is Z. What about four? Well, I cannot see four dimensional space, but don't worry. Human beings cannot visualize more than three dimensional because we live in a three dimensional space most of the time, almost three. Without relating this separate thing. But when you talk about higher dimension here, I can think of these three numbers that I get, height of the histogram. Let's say this is, I don't know, some 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 90, but also add up to 400, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think. I don't know if it will add up to 400 or not, but it should add up to 400. Then I'm just putting in a number. This is your X1, call it your X2, call it your X3, call it your fourth dimension, fifth dimension, six, seven. And you can call this as the third value or whatever, but have them in the same order every time. Now you have a seven dimensional vector space as opposed to two dimensional. As far as dot product is concerned, it is the same formula. Instead, what you do here is continue doing this. And here also you keep adding square, 
keep adding this under the square prime. So it's the same formula, except the dimensions have increased. Then you are like, what is this? I am in a three-dimensional world. Well, vector of multi-dimension, more than two or three dimension, is more of a mathematical abstraction. And you can see that if things are very similar, two C's are very similar, this dot product will be very close to one. But not exactly one. Yeah, not exactly one though. What do you do with that? Where is the boundary? And you need a clustering algorithm or a neural network to figure that out. Because, think about it, so, so where do you do a cutoff? It could be all kinds of C's, your whole document can have lots of thousands of seeds, many are clustered, where do you draw a line? You cannot just go ahead and draw a line mechanically, so you would use a neural network or a clustering algorithm to automatically figure that part out, so that you don't make a human error, because two human beings always do two different things. <clears throat> so that gives you a sense of how two different seeds are almost equal when the values are higher. And I explained Niels' question on uh, on, 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 I forgot now. So, but this is how you calculate the similarity, similarity matrix. And in order to decide when is C, when is A, you will get a different value. Now, Kamal's question. What about O and zero? I really hope that zero has more slightly different signature. But if you use the exact same O, in all prior priors, then there is no way to distinguish. If they, but zeros, if it is longer, maybe you'd expect the number of dark pixels to be slightly shifted, right? Because it has more kind of area that is dark than O is smaller. More pixel count will be slightly shifted. And there, there we'll have an error sometimes. Maybe two, three percent error, misclassification that's called. And that is a problem. And that's why different methods are there to refine. So then you might say, well, it's really a problem. I cannot go around in life <clears throat> saying zero for O. So then what you need to do is that as an engineer, any, if it's a loan, think about it. Would you call it zero? No, why? Loan is a word found in the dictionary. So then you leverage the dictionary to <clears throat> disentangle that confusion. That is, Another algorithm you'll have. Uh, Kamal, did it you, uh, explain your question? Uh, yeah, I got a fair idea on that. Yeah. So that's how you have to think as an engineer. Yeah. As machine data science. And that's why data science is very interesting. You see how you exploit that additional input. Right, right, right. Yeah, got yeah. It. So, but we did all the math, cool stuff, great, imperfection, but then there we did the final. And that's how you take the big contract. <clears throat> because you can do it, not everybody can. So, shall we take a 10 minute break here? So, we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll okay. again yes, start sure. after 10 minutes. In the meantime, I charge my microphones.
Neil, can you hear me? Yes, clear. Okay, good. So, shall we begin? <clears throat> yes, go ahead. So, any questions so far in this part? Hi, Kishan. Hey, Sarok. Yeah, just one question. Uh, as you are talking about the OCR, mm -hmm. so and the scan uh, images also, right? Mm -hmm. Scan document. And if it's a handwritten, it will be very difficult because every people has their own hands of writing, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the continuous character also be there. So how it would be recognized the continuous character? Right. So that is very interesting topic. And that's one relevant question. And we'll... So handwriting is very difficult. It's a very difficult problem for OCR. There are deep learning methods that capture certain structures. So for example, when I write A, you write A, there is a structure, but it's very hard to do this kind of geometric calculus. For that, we would need probably convolutional neural network or deep learning, where you can learn these structures. Oh, always there is a segment. Okay, I see that segment. Okay, there is a next segment. Or then there is another segment. But maybe the segment, the shape does not matter as much. But the strokes, how, you know, kind of these indications. That is for us called convolutional neural network, which can exploit that, but not this method. And in fact, for Indian languages, the script is more complex. Even optical character recognitions, sometimes even in uh, printed form is not as accurate as the English one. <laughs> because in English, they use the Roman script, which is much more simpler. And that gets, you need to exploit techniques that are, that can, learn the higher levels of like careful learning. So then what is, why don't everybody use that method everywhere? Those methods are computationally very expensive. You need GPUs to do calculation. <clears throat> and we can get there actually after, uh, you know, in our class, depending on how we progress or in subsequent classes, courses. So that's the idea. Uh, did it explain sort of? Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, just on similar lines, okay. So I was thinking about this, uh, say for example, this, uh, R itself. So there's a different patterns in which we write R, right? So then we'll have a kind of an array thing which, which we define like, okay, if this is the structure, this represents R. Right. So there can be multiple, multiple patterns of a single yeah. character, right? That is a very good question. Now, I think we, all, we don't need this uh, figure anymore. I'm going to use the word, and that's a good question. I'm going to answer that. So you see, histogram, seemingly a very innocent looking method, can go a long way. And that's why I like these questions. Even though it's simple, ask away as many questions as you can, because then it helps me to explain you in different ways and connect different things. Okay, so I have got, I don't know, one document, please. And my job is to take the, um, what's it called, motor vehicle inspector's office documents from 1973, convert them into automatic form. 
I know there was a typewriter at that time. They used those kind of typewriters back then. <clears throat> so I'll get a bunch of documents. Then I will use my image processing software to clip all these images of characters. And then I'm going to create my vectors, feature vectors. These are actually numbers. And then I'm going to take a lot of them. I know that this is from C. Say, suppose this is from a C. This is from a C. This is C, C, C. And I know the actual numbers. Ah, then these are A. I'll take about 20 of them, 20, 30 of them. Okay. I'll keep collecting. Then I'll collect B. These are all Bs. I know them because they are B because I examined it by hand. And finally, Z even. These are numbers I collect. So what have I got here? I actually got myself a training data. The algorithm now, or method you use, you use this data to train. This is called a C pattern. This is called a B pattern. I cannot teach everything, but I will have to give a large number of samples, 30 or 40. C, because I already know I can hand examine, right? Okay, these are C. This is the training set, essentially. Training set. And the algorithm we will use, we use this to learn these patterns. And now, when a new document comes or any other character you have not seen, you get the feature vector from that feature vector, my algorithm, which is being trained or learned, learned, who has learned this or trained, rather trained, trained. And then it can say, oh, it's a C or it's a D. So you train the algorithm. This is where, to me, when you say machine learning, it's like you are learning this pattern with a machine. When you get a new character, now you can classify them, whether it is C or A or B. Did it explain, come up? <clears throat> yes, so it, it's a continuous learning that it has yeah. to go ahead, go through. Yeah, yeah. got your point, thank you. Yeah. So actually, that is a good question. Continuous learning, and learning at one shot that brings us to another topic, which will not go, but I just want to make. In this case, you first day or before you use it in the market, or screen them in documents, and the algorithm has learned. By learn means it adjusted some parameters. From then on, you can continue using it. There's no need of continuous learning, but rather use of continuous use. Use as many times as you want, but learn one time. There are some algorithms who can learn incrementally as things evolve, but those are different. <clears throat> so that's the idea. So now I want to go uh, give you a very quick idea about standard deviation. Before that, I want to just talk about the vector and then we'll leave it at that and go back to coding because we also have to do some Python and calculate these vectors. And so before doing up, the intuition is that you saw that we have always worked with two dimensional or three dimensional vectors in engineering. Suddenly I have become seven dimensional vectors. <clears throat> so think of vectors in two dimensions or in three dimensions, let's say two dimensions. Like this. Something start from zero and set a point. Right? Start from zero except ends at a point. And these points, where it ends, is defined by these coordinates. This is X and Y. From now on, I will not call X and Y. Rather, X2 means Y. This is a symbol I used to say. This is the same thing that means equivalent. Then, because we are not dealing with X, Y, Z dimension in space. It's a general law. So this is an abstract notion to imagine and do our calculations. Now, if you talk about vector, it has a length and direction. So, and it's completely defined by that. So the norm of a vector, let's call it a V. Some people use a symbol, one symbol, and bold it 
or some people put an arrow. Okay? So in before you used to use this I and J here. Uh, in the case of Y, you use this X I, Y J, and this. And if you have two vectors, V1, V2, then X2 I plus Y2 J, and you would be like doing a dot product. And then you'd say X1, X2 plus Y1, Y2. That's what you used to do. It's the same dot product we are going to deal with now, generalized. So, <coughs> so any vector. So now, if we can think about two dimension, why can I not do three dimension? Who is, if we can do three dimension, I can do four dimension, five dimension. Who is preventing me to carry forward this mindset? This has nothing to do with actual space. But it is the, our imagination. The structure is there to exploit so that we can think along with an algorithm. So, if we want to say from our character the seven dimensional vectors, say this is one, x2, x3, x4, two values I got, five, x6, x7, v2, we can use this. And we'll also see in document classification later. I'll exploit this fact more and more. X5, X6, X7. Okay. When you want to calculate the dot product, you simply do I1 from 7, XI dot XI prime. This Multiplied by this when i is one, this sum two three. That's what this sigma is for. That's what I got to talk about. But there is an issue here. Let's go back to our analogy that we have two characters, C and A. And suppose instead of seven, we have only two dimensions. So I got another print where. Slightly, you know, they look the same structure, but they are a little bit longer. So everything looks same, but they are a bit longer. It can happen, maybe intensity is high, maybe the pixel size is high, but they are conceptually similar. So I need to scale them. I want to do as if they are of one unit length, as if they are one unit. It makes the comparison easier, right? We always do how much do you charge for one liter of milk? It's a liter, one liter. Not, we never go price with like three liters of milk, right? One, it's easy, university. So if we want to do one liter, so I want to talk in terms of when the vectors are of each size one. Because I got the sense how it looks. So that they look in the same structure, one. If you want to do that, you have to adjust the numbers. The way you get is unit vectors. If somebody gives you a vector, x1, x2, this is how you represent it, okay? Tapu, it's called tapu. Remember? If somebody says, how, what is the length? This is how you do it. This is the symbol. Like this. Okay? Some people use this actually in case of vectors. Uh, so, <clears throat> in real life, how do you divide? If I tell you uh, five liter, liter milk cost me 100 rupees, how much is one? You divide it by five, that unit. Same way, you divide. This is it. This is what you do. You divide each value by the size of the vector or the norm. You scale it to everything is unit now. Well, if everything is unit, if we have these two factor, when you normalize it, it's called normalize, make the length unit. Why is it unit? Can I show you that this is unit? Uh, this is prime, I call it, okay, to make it unit. What is the length of the vector? I use this, this is the Euclid's formula. This is the length of the size of a vector, like it's from the, you know, Pythagoras theorem. 
this is x, this is y, same thing. Generalize it to any dimension as you want. Let's look at this, this length. Now I have scaled the values because I divided it by the size of this. Let's see how we get the length. Okay, this is the new value. Square, find x2, sure, square, great. So then this is common. I can pull this out and there is a square and square root. So I can bring it out all the way outside. Then I am left with x1 square, x2 square. Well, x1 square, x2 square root is v itself, you see? So I got, you see, the length has become one. We are going to use the same thing in multidimensional space. We don't want to take dot product in this length. If the length size is not important. We want to scale it, normalize it each by the corresponding v1. Each one by this. So that the, only we care about the sense of direction of unit one. For him, you normalize it by his length to whatever. All of them divided by this. This is V2, right? Do for all. Do for all. How do you calculate V2? V2, again, the same style. It's seven dimensional. V2 here would be. Sum of, instead of writing one, one, all right? One, two, one, seven. X, I, squared. Okay. So, Let's wipe this out and redefine carefully. But I want to give you the idea. Let's redo it carefully now. Any questions so far? I'm going to redo the same thing in a cleaner way. To give you the idea. <clears throat> So, from now onwards, a feature vector, vector, for our machine learning people, we care about feature vector, usually looks like this. You can call it V, right? Uh, v is a vector. This is coming too much from physics. I'm going to use a different symbol instead of this. Most people like to use this symbol. In textbook, you will see bold-faced X. Same size, small x, but both base. And up to any. In our case, it's seven for OCR that in the example, it could be any that n. This is what. Uh, this is a vector. Now, the size of the vector or the norm, okay? And you put a square to mean that it's square based Euclidean. First, you square each component or feature individually by square it, sum them up all the way up to n dimensional vector, square it. This is always positive, right? Always positive. Now, <clears throat> the cosine angle of two vectors, that I should again use this symbol. I have supposed two vectors now. I want to find similarity between two characters like common symbol. X1, and suppose I have another call, X2. Okay. Great. I want to do that cosine angle, or the dot cosine of X. It's a measure of similarity, right? The way you do it is you make sure you do the normalized version. X, I, uh, oh, I have a problem here because I call it one, two, it's confusing. So as a result, I'm going to invent my own symbol. You should do that always, this instead of prime. I can use also prime. Some people use prime. 
like this. Depending on, but that's the you multiply component wise, add them one, two, and and do not forget to divide them by the norm. Norm, which is how I write. We wrote like this. One to n, x i's first guy's norm. So there are two guys who are, you know, um, so this is the idea. So let's try keep writing a little bit, make it simpler. Well, this you I could have written it like this. Right? I can these are same, these are same, these are in a separate block. I can simply do xi, move this here, move that here for each individual component. I can write the same thing. Square one to n dot sigma xi prime square and n square. Well, what was this? This is the same norm business I was talking about. It's essentially the norm of, these terms are norm of, this is what norm x, norm of this x prime, and this is the norm of this x. So then I can write like this. Sigma is x prime. dot xi prime, and this is prime No, that's all, I'm doing component wise addition. So, so far so good. So essentially, this is simply not, not product of these two norm guys. And these are, if you look at it, these are like two vectors, I'm taking the drop for us. How do they look? They each look like that. Norm of x that's all. And then I had another one and I took the dot product. So these are just numbers. These are just numbers between zero and something, maybe five, six. So let's calculate the norm of one number and then let's get back to programming. Because at the end of the day, this is good to know a little bit of theory. This is like dot product of, this is the dot product of that, cosine is that. Dot product of two normalized factors. This gives you a measure of similarity. <coughs> now, suppose somebody gives you a two-dimensional factor, three, okay? And the value is say two, four, six. What do you, you know, how do you, What's the size of this vector? This is how you do. Four square plus six. Four, sixteen, twenty-six. This is only fifty-six. This is the norm. Whatever fifty-six is, right? Seven point something. Seven point something. That's the norm. So essentially, it would be like dividing to normalize this vector. We just do fifty-six. Four fifty-six six root square root of fifty-six. That's what you're doing essentially. Scaling the vectors. Any questions so far? I'm going to now uh, show uh, how we can create a Python class. My class the job is to create do calculations on vectors. Normalize it, do this, do that. That's all I'm going to do. That's an example that we will be using. Any questions so far? All right. So let's, Neil, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay. I'm saying it. Also good. Yeah. Any question? Uh, no, this is fine. This is all mathematics. Okay. So I'm going to now do some Python programming because we need to implement things in class, how to take a vector, how to do calculations. A lot of these things are built into the NumPy library, that's why we use it, but we should learn how to do it from scratch. 
for the purpose of learning. Okay, so I'll share my screen now. <coughs> Are there questions? Oh, yeah. Share my screen. Okay, so first, okay, first I need my pie chart. So I'm going to go to my pie chart. I install it in my folder by term. I'm going to start it now. By term, bin, by term. This is how I started. So we are going to see last time's program, but we are going to pick up on that. But today, let's see how to write a class. One minute. So, okay. Right. This. Okay, so I'm going to open it in. So I'm, I'm going to open up PyCharm and then find my folder when that matters to me. Uh, home. Oh, Ubuntu, I think it's Ubuntu. Python, okay, Python, okay, I want to see that Python code that I wrote for you. Python program, here, Python program. Now, I'm loading the Python program that we wrote last time. So, we always give some tips. Okay, so last time we were doing a code that we took a file, parsed it, and so on which is good, you could run our code and then split it. But there was an issue here. First, I have to make sure uh, this text file is in the same folder. I can put it as this and let's run it. Neil, can you see my screen? Yes, it's clear, yeah. So I'm just going to run this to recall what we were doing last time. Oh, error running this. Okay, so it says that there is no code called Python run. Oh, interesting. Python program, Python program, let's run it. I see, so configure Python. So now what I did is that I moved the file from one place to another. So now that file, it is looking for that. So instead, I'm directly going to run this code. It's run Python Pro. It's a, it created a project before. Now it's not finding it. Ah, I see, okay. So what you do is edit configuration. So then you find out what is the code that you want to run. Script path is here. Uh, working directory is missing, okay, here. Okay, so let's see. Invalid Python interpreter selected for this. Okay. View. Is it good to go through this uh, struggle? Configure Python interpreter. So which one do I want to use? 2.7, let's see. 3.5, uh, virtual environment, okay. We'll use a Python interpreter. Okay. Python, there are several versions of Python, I'm just choosing one. Or you don't have to worry about like picking different. And now configuration see. Let's see if I can run it now. Run it. Okay. It says run it. Okay. So cannot run program. So anything that we need to import here. Last time we were importing. So let's see, debug. Okay, so it said that it could not open some file. Okay, so it was trying to run something and it could not open a file it looks like. Well, let's see what we got here. Encoding buffering. 
So here I am now trying to evaluate <clears throat> step by step. Okay, F8. I think the file is missing from the current directory. Do we have the file? Yeah, I think you're right, actually. I'm just making sure because I moved all the programs from one place to another. You're right. I should open it, open a new window. Let's see. All right. We'll get there. But that's good. Uh, yeah. Let me exit it, terminate it. That's what we want. Uh, so we want to debug it. And debug it. So special variable icon no I see okay. File name is this. <clears throat> Stop here and then I might have created two projects by mistake. So let's see. Um, so now I will put this into there. And then debug Python Pro, debug test to local process. Then we need to look at a test. Run shift ten debug shift nine. Oh, okay. So, so now, these if at all there is debug, it may work here because as I explained last time, these are just definitions. Nothing has happened yet. The script that you run from it automatically has a variable. Python has these variables called name. If you run from a script, the first script that you run, it gets the name called me. And that's what I'm checking. If you are me, you got to run, right? So now I'm going to put, it's trying to open a file name actually. Let's see what it is trying to do. Create word count. Run Python. Um, I'll do, okay, let me see if this file is there. Because uh, let me close that. So I'm creating another here. Python code. So I see. So this is where the Python code program is in. So this is what I want to deal with. Uh, it means the personal environment as well. So let's see Python program. What does it have? So it has this. Okay. So let's see what when we run it mechanically. So okay. So we'll come to that editor. First, how do you run a Python code on the terminal? This is how you run. 
Of course, it did not find something called text.txt. <laughs> we come back to that. Okay. So it needs a folder called a file called text.txt. Uh, oh, I do not see it. Okay. So it is in the file above actually. One step. Uh, so I can move that text here. Okay, so those were our last time's count. But here is something I want to show you. I wanted to feed in this file. What would be the right file, a way to feed it? So usually in Linux, you are used to typing a command this like. So I want to show you something else here. So let's go there. And this is our code. What I want to do is that you see this Linux commands ls minus l gives me this. These are called options. Cat, text. These are options. How do you create the Python that has command line options? So I want to talk about it quickly. <coughs> so at the very beginning, then we will make it a function, then we will test it, then we will add this in the debugger. So now, when you start a code in the main, I do not have any idea how to start your program. So I'm going to use DI, you know, but you don't have to use, you can use the IDE. But I'm going to show you how to, because it's easier to step by step show. So look at this. Neil, can you see my screen? Yes, it's clear now. Yeah. So look at this, we wrote a function and we defined all this word counting business. Then at the end, I added this name and this is where calculation starts. From line number 43, from line number 3 to 49, that is 3, this one, this one. So all of them are essentially definition of a function that it can do this. And here I am using it. And calling a function text. So the reason I'm now switching to this is that I want to show you how do you write a command. In, as a data scientist, you are not going to write run command using ID. You do development, but not in production. So in Python, you need to do something called command line argument. So what you do is import something called arg parse. I'll tell you what it does. Arg parse. <clears throat> is a way to tell you thing that when you create a parser, variable called parser, P-A-R-S-E-R, this is what okay? Surely we have an import on line number five or something. Uh, say that again? Yeah, we have a, I mean, import again on line number five, we can remove that, I mean. Ah, I see, okay, line number five, right? Yeah. Line number five, oh yes, yes, it's redundant, you're right, thank you. So R parse. So R parse is a library here, and it has a class I'm going to use. That's called argument parser. So then I'm going to say that parser add argument. Parser add argument. <coughs> And I call it minus f uh, dash f i or input in i. And you have to call it destination. Destination is a variable name. I'll tell you what it means. You just give it all file name or input file. Anything you choose. Input file. Default, uh, I don't need to do anything. Now I call it args. Okay, that. So what it does is that argument parser is something that grabs hold of the variables that come in to the when you execute the program. What do I mean by command line execution? Here is one. Python is a Python interpreter you are calling. File name is a variable. You might want to say that I is text different file at different times. Well, in this case, it did not matter because I have already built it. I have already, I have, it did not care. But what I want is a user kind of a manual. And I, I also want to describe how this tool should be used. Let's try again. 
Let's look at this. I have done is dash h. So it says this is how you use the file. Python, then I input file, an option. You see. Then I might want the output file somewhere. So let's use that input file. And let's have two files, text one and text two. Let's copy text two, text one. Text one, we'll have two arguments here. So, uh, now I want to go back to the file. So again, I'm using DI editor just to show you how to use this command line. So instead of this, let's look at what it means. Print ARDS input file, dot input file. This is where it's coming from. You see dot input file. So now after you do these steps, this step gets ready the partial. This you define arguments. This you take care of the arguments, read them in. From then on, because you put here input file, whatever you put after the option dash r, it will be in this variable. <clears throat> so let's see what it does. But I don't want to execute the entire code for you. So what I do, I want to exit the code. In order to exit, you do sys there in the sys library. Okay. Quickly exit. And you have to import it, of course. You can import it. You can do it in the same line. Or you can do it separately. Import a file. Right? So let's see again. What do I get? If I put dot my dash h, it always shows you how to use it. But I want to use it actually text. Yeah, All it did is printed the name of the file that I sent. Let's put text one. You see text one I got it. Uh, I think I should write it nicely. It's harder to see already. So we um, next one. I call the first one text zero. So anyhow, I'm going to say that you know it just printed out the name. So that means I can actually directly tell him that you know what. Here, when you do sys exit, the code exits. It never reached here. So now I'm going to tell him that read that file instead. ARGS input file. Remove it. And it will do that calculation for you. Sure, a whole lot of junk that is not useful. I want to actually put that at that print. Number some statistics so that we can distinguish between the all it did it printed the number of lines and all. So I'm going to print here is that number of number of distinct words. This is how you write in a string, and in the string you can format right away with double parentheses like this. Okay. And right next to the string, you type format and you put the value you want to print. For example, in this case, I care about the number of elements in the dictionary called word counts. That's all. So, as you remember last time, what we did, I'll come back and visit this function. Um, I want to show you. Maybe I should make this uh, higher. Here, there is an invalid in syntax <clears throat> in line 16. What do you think went wrong? One parenthesis, another, so there is one more missing. And I don't know if you need to print this. This is how you comment it in Python. Let's look at it now. The number of distinct words is 244. 79. Right, that is good. So, so far so good. We have created a function. We have created an argument also. How to provide arguments from the outside. Right? Um, 
I will also add some more information. Input file name. Input file name. Input file name ARGS input file. Great. Let's print it now. Let's see. Okay, input file is this. And now you may want to do something it is called output file. Actually. You may want to write output. How do you do that right? I uh, know. So in order to do output, Say I want to write these two results in a file. I create another option. I call it O. I call it distance output file, or whatever you want to call it. Now I want to print these lines in the output file. So what I do, I click add in this. What you did, you created a dictionary, and you open the file as a read mode, and this is the file handle. Then you iterate it line by line, split the lines into spaces. Then you looked at each word. Then you apply, make sure that that word has to have A or as A to Z, some, right? Then you apply each of your patterns to remove, clean up these unwanted characters. Then you took the word. If the word is already in the dictionary here, not in the dictionary, then you insert it with a zero and then you incremented the word. So you are essentially counting the number of words. And here you are returning it from the function. So first, things first. So I added this output. How do I do the writing? Writing is done in a right open like this. Except here you put W. Except here you call the output file. ARGS output file. Okay, so now I need to write these statements, right? Not on the screen, but actually it should go into a file. Why don't we do both? We print it on the screen as well as on the file. Or maybe the file, uh, maybe we should put the word counts inside, inside the file. That's the output. <clears throat> so I'm going to each key. That means each word in the word count, and I'm going to print the first word. This is a very bad way of printing. So because it's called a file handler, it's called FP, or you can call it F out. I'm going to write like this. Instead of print, I call it F out. And because it's a file handler, it has a function called write built into it. I'm going to first type the key, the string. Well, instead of a string, I can do this. First thing, tab, second thing, and I'll tell you what I need. And you do the same thing. The first parenthesis, the value of the key goes in, and the second one, the count goes in. And, and. But you, there will be a problem here, but I will show you. And with this block, as you know that Python does not use parenthesis, rather it defines block by indentation. This width, Pulls from line number 66 to 68. This for loop runs from 67 to 68. This is how we do. So let's run it and see what we got. I'm not going to provide anything. Of course, it fails somewhere. So it says invalid syntax, print format, that's more of a one, two, three, yeah. So 71 lines. I want to deliberately make mistakes so that we can actually. Observe. Okay, so our format, so we could not write here. Okay, so this looks like a double parenthesis problem. I need to parenthesis. Let's run it. Okay, so what happened here? How to read the error? This is why I'm doing it. I tried to open in line number 66, coercing to Unicode need stream or buffer. What is this value here? Did I give anything? Doesn't well, look like I didn't give any value. All right. So that means it is nothing. How can you have a file name that has nothing as its name? So you must, must provide. 
I want, I, how do I fill this argument partial? Required two, you have to supply that. You see? The error now? That is a must. Argument O is required. Minus O this time. I am like, okay, so that's what you want, I'll give you that. X dot here. Uh, so we printed the things to screen, what will do x dot px do? Too bad. A whole bunch of words and numbers stuck together. It's just one line. Just one line, you see? The problem is that this time, instead of print, I use something from the right. Right does not put a new line. Print by default puts a new line. Right? You put it yourself. Let's try it again. Voila. There you go. So this is this shows that you can write tools in this format. So that if you are going to be a data scientist and you are going to design algorithms that somebody else will run, you will run production systems you have to have some coding standard. And also you should put comment that I'm not going to talk about because all of you know how to do commenting, that it's a useful thing. Uh, do we have any question here? So that I can, I'm going to go to class soon uh, and how to import modules. Uh, Kishore, you one question? Yes, sir. Uh, so this is uh, the code we have written for a VI editor, right? Yes. So we are li uh, listening to the arguments, and if we run the same code in the ID, ID it won't work, yes. right? Yes. I mean, because we are not ex expecting any arguments sure. in there, right? Mm -hmm. I will show you now. That so this. Good. In that case, what you do, you do edit configuration, mm -hmm. and you set up here, and there will be arguments here. These are here. You do minus i. I don't know, x dot o dot txt minus o output file name dot txt. This is how you have to set up. Okay. And that is important for debugging. Uh, so that is for your own code development uh, in ID. But the reason I'm doing in command line is that I want to show you why I need it. Where do you need this command line? It's because in ID systems, as you know, all, all of you know, it's runs in batch systems. Today, we've been running cloud systems. Um, so you don't get an ID. Yes. So that's ID. <laughs> yeah. So you now, it. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I don't want to have this function in my file. It is very ugly. I don't like it. So where do I put it? So look at my folder now. What do I have? P files. One output, one Python program. I should call it, in fact, Python program. Two. This is what we are going to be talking I should add that up to last time we got Again, this is, and let's look at my Python. This is ugly. I have the same thing, everything, and the whole function, if I have to do another, I would rather this file be somewhere else. Let's create a file, another file. Python, call it my. Uh, parser. I call it my counter. Uh, my counter, I will call it. Create a file, my counter. My counter, I'm going to remove everything except this file. Oh, I have to create it early because I use it here. I don't use it anything else. Remove everything. Nothing here. Create, uh, all I did is define the function and define imported only what I need to do, nothing else. And it opens a file layer, it's its own business, uh, how it does, I don't care. So now let's go back to my own code. Because I used it there, I don't need to use it here. Will it work? Who knows? Let's see. Let's run. Let's run. As you know, we have just changed the name of the file, so I'm going to call it two now. 
see it says this dictionary is not defined, create word dictionary. What is it? It's a function. It's got to be something. What do we do there now? Where do we do that? I know that it's in this folder, mycounter.py. Okay. So why don't I do import mycounter? Right? Okay. Or I will call it utility. Uh, I'll call it this. It's something silly. And I accordingly change the name of the file, my counter to this. My counter to this. Yeah, see? Now, what do I have? I have a Python folder of file called utils here. And I am going back to my favorite code and I'm importing utils. Can I use it? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Let's see if I can do it. Not defined. Well, util is the entire Python program. It's a, it can have many Python programs, right? I can have another calculation utils. Let's do another thing. Yes, definition of average mean calculation. We put a number array, x. Over array and I do some other calculations, say average of some number. I will return zero for now. Just return zero. It's not doing anything, it's a wrong calculation, but dummy, dummy function. Dummy function. Or uh, dummy, it says in dummy. If you call it, if you have any value, you call it, I'm a dummy. Dummy function. That's all it does. Okay. I, I have many things, still does not find it, where is the problem? Let's go back to the problem. So what you should import is not the entire folder, you can you have two ways of calling it. Because you are importing utils, and utils has a function called, you see, you can put a dot. Then, in the utils, you see the whole thing, it will look for a function. Will it work? Voila, it works, see? That's why you are seeing this. Uh, let's say why. There you go. Let's remove these EXT files. These are, oh no, uh, remove X and XTXT. Y. So now you've got an idea. That from the utils file, any function can be directly called if you call, import the whole utils. This is your Python library, this is called. Well, I, somebody might say that I really don't like this. What is this UT? Too much more work. You can call it as X, doesn't matter. It becomes an alias, you see? That is what we were doing when we were calling NumPy as NP. It's a short form, you see? Doesn't matter, it's just a name. Sometimes this gets boring. I really would like to like go like this. Instead of that, what I'm going to do is this. From utils, import, this is common, import this. This is what you can do. It only imports that function. You see, it works. So sometimes I also I want I also want to call it dummy, you know, that dummy function. Remember, uh, I think I call it dummy function or something. Let's see what it is. Dummy, yes, dummy. Something I have to send. Doesn't matter what I have to send. Yeah, yeah. Print of the dummy. It prints nothing. Dummy. Will it work? No, it will not work. It doesn't find them. Can I do this? Oh, it didn't work because although Python, single quotes, double quotes is the same thing, but they have to match it, the type. Okay, you cannot do this. You cannot do high this. Either do this, or do, or let's 
wrong is wrong. So I am at step. Now let's run it. I am a dummy function. So this gets boring. Does it think about every function I have I have to write them in? I'm not going to do that for you. And I'm going to make life easier for you. So let's start. That means everything. Any questions? This is how you develop Python libraries. You put your function in a Python file somewhere and keep calling from there. Just import it. That's the idea of importing functions and modules. And in fact, all of these are also Python modules. Except they are in a standard place where Python is installed. There are also libraries you are importing. That's why you are using here, you see. Uh, okay, let's go to the other one. Mm, yeah, parser, arc parse. Here, I imported arc parse. Of course, there is a, something defined as this. And that has also a function defined as this. That's what I'm using. <clears throat> In fact, here we don't even need the R. Yeah, I can show you that. One quick question here. Yes. See, you imported this, uh, the user defined function that you just created with the name. So that means it should be in the current directory, right? Uh, if, can you just open, can you just open that code? I, I'll just have a query here. Uh, you can, right? No, 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 no. Uh, go, go to the main, main place. Yeah. Python or program dot two. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So here, for example, we are trying to import utils. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that utils and the, this main program are in the same directory. That is a very good question. No, but my, my question comes here is, but we are importing the user, like the, the Python defined functions, like sys, r parse, all those things, which are not there. I don't see that in the current directory, right? They are not in the current directory. They are so, uh, the standard path that Python correct. defines. Okay. And those are uh, Python. They are in the sites Python package. There is a specific place in the Linux or Mac. Okay comes from there. Okay, because, because if, if I'm just compare with my, uh, like for example, Java, so we have to give the complete qualified path, say example, yes. dot db, data plus that, but yes. here we are not mentioning that. So still it takes it from some kind of a repository, right? Yes, it is coming from the set variable. And also there is a system variable we use. Okay. You see where they are? Okay, got you, yes. That so is a the, variable that exists. And you, they reside there, those happy packages. The site packages. Got you now. To clarify. Thank you. Now, there is another thing. Life is not so easy. I'm going to create my library folder. Call it npdir libs. Python libs. P, pi libs, I call it. Okay. I'm creating my own Python library. So let's look at it. Pi libs. I'm going to push my utils to pi libs. Pi libs. Life is easy. Uh, I'm going to show you how my files are. This is where my files are. This is the file names. Within that, there is a new file. And that's this level, I have this and Great. If it has to work, and because I have put in a file names, maybe this is what I should do common sense to say, this is how you do it. File names dot. That dot tells you that it's in a folder. You can create your own library <clears throat> like this. But there is a problem here. It may not work. There is a kick out to it. No module called PyLeaks Utils. But I just created it. So what you do in that kind of folder that where you store a lot of Python libraries, you create a file, empty file, and it has this special name in it underscore underscore dot file. Just have it there. It's empty, there is nothing. I'm just going to show you. It's nothing here. It is a symbol to tell Python that, you know what? Keep you like a library if you want to do it. You see, now it works. That is an important thing to remember. So any folder you want to dump your libraries, dump, keep this in a file. Then, you would be able to use that if you use, you know, import, then you can understand that this library has packages installed. 
Any questions so far? So, so these are these are these are kind of some uh, some def uh, like uh, predefined rules which Python is expecting, right? Yes. Say for example, underscore underscore main, and then you see this underscore underscore in it. So yes. we have certain set of rules which we have to follow for Python. Yes. So do we have similar things? Maybe there are many more, right? Um, there are not many more actually. There are only a few. Okay. Okay. There are not many. I'm exhausting. That's why this is quite exhaustively I'm showing you. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, great, great. Yeah. So, so far, so good. So, uh, for, uh, now what we are going to do is that can I build a class that can tell that uh, in the class I will feed in a file and then he will tell me different things about the files. How many lines are there? How many words are there? You know, uh, which one is the most frequent word and so on and so forth. Maybe, right? Um, or tell me if there is a word that is in the file or not. I want that kind of system. I love a function. Let's try a function. Five, uh, okay, so now I am in Python. So now that brings us to the definition of class. File steps, I'll call it. File steps. This is the, you know, that's like Java, it's a base object. That's all you keep once, you know. Okay, so in a way, I have created a class that will help me doing all these things. And even word counting and all this is not my business. This file should, these guys should be for me. So, what I'm going to do is that create a class called C equal to file steps. This is how you call a function, you use a function. The files class, file, you use the keyword class, give the name, and these are inheriting from the base object. And pass, pass means nothing. Because you cannot put nothing in anything. You have to have, pass is like, you know, in the assembly language, no op command that you used to have, NOP, it does nothing. Just the space fill up. So, can I run this? Let us see what happens. I have defined a class that I'm trying to give it. Well, it did something, maybe nothing. Well, I would like this class to have something about that input file. I really would like to tell him that the moment I create a class, I will give him an input file and he will do things for me. Let's see what happens. Nothing. It does not take parameters. Of course, it does not take parameters, right? If it has to take parameters, this is what you do. Class, inside class, you define a certain method. Init is one. You see these underscore, underscore, these are special usually in Python. Just like name. These are important. And this is self. It's something the first variable talks about itself, its own reference. You can use any word. Convention is to use self as a word. But you can use a new one. And the function is called file name. So essentially, this is what it is doing. This file set, that class, if you want to directly call it an argument, you have to have a file called init. And the first function has to be, first argument has to be self or any word, something. That will be its own reference to itself. <clears throat> and file name. Is that enough? Well, we can load that and uh, use our function, word function. So I'm creating, immediately going, instantiating the object, reading the file name, this time I don't need to file name, reading the file name, getting the dictionary and story inside. Now any question you ask, it will tell you how to, how to do that. Let's see what happens. Let's get rid of this. Uh, let's not go further sys exit so that it does not exist by the new code. Okay, I need to do anything. Did it do anything? Did it enter here at all? I will use the debugger, but I'm just going slowly here to show you how libraries are organized. In debugger, it's harder to show you that. So that means 
Every time you call this function first time, you need to speed it once. That means this. Okay, so then I can say num words. I can feed functions. Num words. You can get me the number of words. You get a friends itself. If there is no argument, you still have to say self at this function. I will return the return. How many number of words are there? The number of keys. And this is how you get it in a dictionary. Because you know word counts in the dictionary. Num words. I want to see print. Num words. So C is the name of the class, object, and the function is called num words. Thank you, that's it. Let's see what happens. Word counts is not defined. Okay, word counts is not defined. Word counts is not a variable. Well, it is a variable in itself, it's its own variable. How do you define, like in C or something, there is this pointer reference? So, look into yourself. You have that variable. That's what it's a way of saying. Right? So, it has no thing called thing. So, then how do you do that? So, you assign it to itself. See? Number of words is 244. Right? So that means this class has, I have initialized it here. Uh, let's write a document screen. This is how we write. Class initialization function. Right? This returns a number of words, right? Great. Uh, so I can keep adding this. So this means I also can here, then I have to ask him, can you give me one word at a time? So that would be a slightly different uh, way of doing it. But any questions so far? So I have essentially created a class, and I want to put this class inside my utils file actually. I don't want to have it here. And because I'm doing import star, this file steps will also come along. No problem. So let's go to utils now. File loops. <clears throat> here. You have to be careful here a little bit because this, yeah. But we'll see what. I'm going to remove it here. I don't want to have my class of them functions all over the place. Right. So what happened? Level does not let any outer level indentation. So let's go to utils. We must have, we must have made a mistake somewhere. Class level. Oh, yeah. it has to also match the screen indentation. You see here. So that means, what have I done? I have created classes and functions and put them in utils. And I'm able to happily call from this code, right from here. So any questions so far? I have, we have learned how to write arguments, command line arguments. We have learned how to make libraries. We have made how to write classes and put them in libraries and how to keep them in different libraries and so do the other things. So let's see if you have any questions. I think the rest of the time we should focus on discussing concepts. You have learned things um, you might have missed out. I want to make sure that I address the, your questions now. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Yes, uh, just wanted to ask one uh, basic question. Like the class that you created there inside the uh, utils function, 
Uh-huh. So uh, the function word count won't it come un- inside the class? I see. Okay. Yes, you can. Uh, let's do that. What you are saying. Right. Uh, let me see. Line number 13 to line number 58. It is a good question. It's not a silly question though. Uh, 13 to 58. Let's put it inside, right? Essentially, let me tell you something. The class definition ends right here. You see Python does not have that block. So this is a new function standing on its own. Own function. And the class definition ends here too. So now, suppose I want to put it inside the class. So what I am going to do then, all I need to do is adjust it to it like this. So that it works like a parenthesis. Let's do that. 3258, right? Line number. 3258, substitute. Oh no. Uh, 13, sorry. Yeah, I think it matches. I got it right. Yeah. So now, let's see where what happens. Let's run our code. No function defined because it is not in that library. Let's see what happens. So that, as you requested, we have put it inside the class. Very good. So then I can do. First of all, I'm going to be using this, right? Yeah. Well, I can use this as a function. I can use that in this class. Let's see if I can use it. Because now it's in the function. Well, it's still not using it. You know why? Where it fails? It fails in line number six. What is going on here? Line number six has this. He himself doesn't know where to find it. Hey, it's with you on itself. Because he, he owns it now. Now you will see. Create word takes exactly where an argument line number six. What happens now? You see, if it is self, it takes two arguments and I gave him one. Because, because I have put in this file function in this, any function owned by the class has to have this extra reference to the class. So you have to modify that. This self, any class, you see, this has no argument. See, so you have to give self. It's a reference to itself. Now it will work. Did it explain, Melissa? Uh, yes. Yeah, so anytime you have a class method, even if there is no argument, the first argument is always self or reference to a class. And any class that is defined inside the class, make sure you reference it is like this. Any variable, class, anything that is inside the object, you have to use this self-reference. Otherwise, and the first function has to be this in it. That is the that is a, if you do not have to give any argument while creating, you can omit it. Then it's the default in it. It does nothing. But if you want to do something at the beginning, like we wanted to immediately load the function and uh, load the file and start counting the word counting dictionary, then you have to put it. So in it is triggered the moment you hit this kind of a statement. Let me show you this object creation. And look at this. In this case, I directly use the class's own function with the input. I directly give it. And you see that C dot, this is the object, and the self is a reference to that, essentially. That's why that self is required. That means this object's that function. <clears throat> so it's to refer to itself. Now, unlike Java or C++, Python does not have the concept of private or protected variable uh, or public variable. Everything's public. There are ways to get around it that we can visit later, but those are tricks, but not provided directly by the languages. Yeah. So any more, more questions about anything? Vectors, this, that, we'll 
discussed. Hi, Kishori. Yes, Swarup. Yeah, so regarding init, is it uh, same as uh, defining constructor and uh, the self is same as uh, defining this object? Yes, uh, the self works as that this pointer or this reference. Yeah. Uh, and self except you can give any name to it. Just a reference, it comes to me. You can call it in X. Okay. It's a reference to this object that you are talking about. Yeah. Kishori, uh, so can we define properties in uh, to the class and uh, and also the function and methods are similar in class? I mean, uh, is there is a other way of defining method and other way of defining function or they are treat as a similar thing? They are all same thing here because it does not have hmm. function in Python would mean not a part of the class. Yeah, within within a class, if you're defining like oh, I see. there is yes, there is a slight difference. You'll visit it. There are certain class class methods that you can call without being, which is like the static class in I think C plus plus. I don't know if it's in Java or not. Static class you can define. I'll get there. But those are very much like a decorator type. Okay. You and or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and so we can define properties also, like, I mean. Yes, you can define, yeah. Okay. Actually, Python 3 is more suitable for that. So it would be like that only, right? Like self dot any property name equal to value. Yes. Okay. Getter and seller. And it doesn't mandatory, it would be under any class, but it, oh, sorry, inside the function, but it can be anywhere, uh, I mean, maybe at the top level of the class, yeah. defining the properties. Yes, you can define okay. as top level without self. Those mm -hmm. values would be like static variables. That means across the class, there is only one copy. Different objects will share the same values in that case. Those are like and, your static variables. And these property definitions should come after init or it can be above init also? Or? It can be above init also. Okay. Okay. Normally, is the first one people like to by convention. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, keep firing away, guys. Questions. I will give some home assignments also on Python if you guys can uh, give it a try or rather exercise to try it out. Or uh, anything also about these vectors, standard deviation, histogram. Um, yeah, I have a full class for standard deviation, probability distribution of histogram. So that will be we'll be visiting, we'll be simulating, we'll be simulating many, many different kinds of distributions and see where they appear. Uh, how they appear and continue explaining them. Uh, last, uh, so I told you about vectors. I told you about what is the length of a vector or norm. It's the word you use, norm is called. Or magnitude. Then we might ask, is there a way I can look at the difference of a vector? This is of a similarity of sine product. Is. <clears throat> Say if I have two vectors, x and y, you just subtract it, you can do subtraction on the vectors, except they will be component wise subtraction. x1 to y1, this will be x2 minus y2. And then you can also calculate the difference, but that will deal when we need it later. And we'll do uh, machine learning classification. We'll use this. So I just want to make sure that I can provide you some materials, reading materials for vectors, or we can together develop in the next class so that you actually know what it means. Uh, I'll probably provide you with some, and also I'll go through together with you how to calculate these vectors, uh, how to manipulate with these vectors, how to use them. That's what I'll focus on. So I'm trying to go very slowly at a modest pace, 
so that we have our concepts all coming together. Today was a great question about histogram to OCR and different applications. Uh, that was very helpful. And keep asking questions more and more. Uh, this way, I'll be able to take you to different places in the discussions and all. So uh, yeah, let's see if you have more questions, ask away. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. But ask more questions if you have anything. Um, any questions on install tools, software? Well, I'll send you some materials and our, you know, video recording and all. And then why don't we then again, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Last to live. Thank you, Vishwada. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. 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 Okay, Kishori, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yep, see you. See you, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, good night.